Welcome back to Raid Guides in a Trenchcoat featuring the Vow of the Disciple. Drown, 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 drown. After a brief ad clear phase, hop aboard the Weird Darkness Pyramid Tech and ride it through Savathun Swamp like Little Caesars rides on the coattails of the NFL. I don't care if it's hot and it's ready and it's only $5 to feed myself for basically the whole day. I've got a bone to pick with Augustus and Julius Caesar for making two of the hottest months of the year a whole 24 hours longer than they need to be. And don't get me started on the whole September, October, November bullshit. Those two got what they deserved. To keep the metaphor going, every football field or so, the barge will break down on the side of the swamp. To continue, you'll have to kill a horde of scorn while collecting these little darkness dildos from the abominations which contain forbidden knowledge. Bringing these knowledge sticks back to the barge will start to recharge its three-year-old iPhone batteries so that you can move a little further and stave off the hurdle of planned obsolescence. But, much like in real life, you'll only get so far out your front door before the batteries back down to 20%. Collect more darkness dildos of knowledge and debate investing in a portable power bank that you know damn well you'll never have the foresight to recharge. Additionally, if you stray too far from the barge, you'll start getting sacks of pervading darkness which is a debuff that'll slowly make you blind and then you die. After a brief excursion to the secret chest and a not-so-brief excursion of mindless scorn-killing, the barge will run itself into the garage and you'll be knocking on the pyramid's front door. While stuck on making raid mechanics for the first encounter of the raid, the designers at Bungie sat down for a sporting game of Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. One of the devs took a good look at the esoteric nature of the defusal manual and an acquisition was born. Shame it wasn't a stillbirth. The general vibe of the encounter is that you'll have three teams of two where each team has a runner and a defender. Each team will pick one of these three Rubik's Cube obelisks with a whole mess of symbols to stand by, which will be accompanied by a grounded stoplight of empty symbol spots. And with that notion of symbols, now it's time for everyone's favorite segment. Name those symbols. Mary Chrysler. Worcestershire sauce. Would you still love me if I was a worm? Jesus. Super Saiyan Jesus. Vor, Hyper 212X Cooler Master Computer Fan, Titanic Feet Ocean Gate, Oregon Trail, Zavala's Head, Doritos, Doritos 2 Electric Boogaloo, Dorito Dust Gamer Hands, My Legend of Zelda Stamina Bar, Number 15 Burger King Foot Lettuce, Painted Baboon Face, Cuphead, Helicopter Helicopter, Hammer Time, Jigglypuff as seen from above, getting stabbed. Grandma's Rug, Probed, Gay Pride, Predator, Lobotomy, Pink Floyd Dark Side of the Moon, and, of course, Earth. Once the encounter begins, one of the three pillars will gain a symbol at the top, either Dorito or Zavala's head. These symbols are also plastered as huge billboard posters on the front sides of these walls. The runner goes to the side that matches their pillar and plays hide and seek with a taken knight. Killing that knight will spawn the second symbol for you, and then another one of the pillars will activate so that a second runner can start getting calls of their own. The second symbol that is called will denote one of the nine rooms around the arena. Once somebody enters that room, a third symbol will appear which will tell you which of the two taken captains to kill, either Gay Pride or Hyper 212 X Cooler Master Computer Fan. This is where all the other callouts happening on top of yours have the tendency to lead to some unfortunate wipes, which is why it's important to have the three players with the most annoying voices call out so that you'll naturally tune out the other two teams. When a captain is killed, a symbol will appear in the air. That is your symbol. Type it out in chat and then wait for the other two symbols to get discovered. With all three of the symbols called out, find the Rubik's Cube pillar that has all three of the called symbols present and have people shoot those symbols at the same time. Because the Rubik's Cube could smell your rank-ass guardian feet from orbit, it'll reject your offering. You'll reload your weapons, tell it you weren't asking, and then it will accept. That's 33% of the encounter, do that twice more. On the other side of the coin, you'll have the Defenders. With every straight bullet that hits it, the Rubik's Cube will fill itself with Dayquil to try and wash away the pain of its existence. Eventually it will overdose and wipe the encounter, so don't let it get that hurt. This includes bullets from the Phalanx fanboy Scorn, your own guns, and then the beefy ass unstoppable abominations. Also, there's the Door Crystal. The random polyhedron in the middle of the room that you shot to start the encounter acts as a toggle between one half of the room being open and the other. If your runner is ever stopped by a door, they'll begin to whine like a toddler who dropped their stuffed bear out of the playpen and cry until you deal with it. This, of course, leads to the possibility that you lock somebody else into their room, which maybe is a timeout that they deserve. In either case, do all this while making the callouts for your runner, three full rotations, and you'll be on your way to the man who wishes not to be disturbed. Yeah. 
caretaker is the first boss of the raid, and you would not believe how easy he is. If you listen close and behold my teachings, I'll bestow upon you the knowledge that you need. Let's start from the bee girl. You're once again splitting into teams of two, except this time you're actually doing the same thing as your partner. Two runners, two stunners, and two statistically average players which, oh boy are there people bringing down that average. The runners are once again dealing with symbols. Inside of this door is a dark thrallway or room with thick ass yellow bar wizards. There are little darkness dildos scattered around with symbols above them. Collect between one and three of them and then exit the room, taking care not to spend too much time inside as you'll be gaining stacks of that pesky pervading darkness. As you exit, your buddy will open the door and you'll perform the baton pass as they enter in. You'll then be faced with another Rubik's Cube obelisk where you'll have to shoot all of the symbols that you brought out. Worst case scenario, you brought out the three symbols on three different faces of the obelisk, which will probably result in a rejection if you're bad like I am, but other than that, anything you grab is pretty manageable. Trade off with your buddy again and then keep bouncing back and forth until all nine symbols have been imprinted onto the Rubik's Cube, enabling the damage phase. Meanwhile, the stunners are going to double team the caretaker. One person takes his backside and the other takes his front side. You'll get close to him to make him slam the ground, and then you'll each shoot a weak point to make him forget what he was doing like a sim trying to make themselves food while you're actively trying to starve them to death as punishment for being ugly as fuck. That said, caretaker, probably one of the coolest looking bosses we've seen in a raid. The other component of stunning is dealing with the bees. Periodically, Caretaker will shoot out hordes of hornets and you'll have to gun them down before they implant their stingers in your chest and then die anyway. Continue to trade off slams and stuns until the runners are done depositing their symbols. And lastly, the average Joe ad clearers kill ads. The same Dayquil liquid mechanic will be present in this Rubik's Cube, so be sure to focus down the shield bearing Scorn, as well as any of the taken hobgoblins sniping down your stunners. The only reason the stunners took mechanics is because they know their dog shit at clearing ads, and they wanted to make sure they had someone else to blame when they died because ads aren't getting killed. As far as damage is concerned, group up near whichever of these places is closest to the walkway that the boss is walking up. If I might recommend some weapons, Be Loved, Be Quest, just kidding, those are terrible weapons for this encounter. After the boss gets close enough to the Rubik's Cube obelisk, the plate will begin to glow and you'll need to stand on it to do damage. People will try to tell you to hold your damage here so that you don't accidentally phase in before you get a full three plates worth of damage, but let's be honest, you're an NLFG and somebody is going to be pumping damage so that they can lord their numbers over you when you wipe, so you might as well just go balls to the walls. And then, much like the first encounter, that's only the first 33%. Massive staircases will descend and you'll have to climb up to get to the next level and continue. The runner's room will have less and less floor and the damage place will be further and further apart, but the mechanics are functionally the same. Just don't fall down is a long walk of shame back up to the current level. Once you've hit the final stand up at the top level, one last staircase will descend down and you'll have one last hallway of plates to do a mere fraction of the boss's health. Toss your supers, empty your reserves, and then traipse into the jumping puzzle. I don't want to make a whole section on this jumping puzzle because it's bullshit and requires teamwork, but if you lag behind long enough, you can just wait for all these platforms to be locked into position and you'll have a slightly easier time getting up instead of having to communicate with people to turn platforms on or off like the first people will be doing. But once the final straggler is up at this door, you'll be able to progress into the third encounter. The exhibition encounter feels like it was built as a prototype for the new Crucible Relic game mode. Instead of making a new relic to interact with in the raid, they just took three old ones, gave one a new darkness skin, and called it an encounter. The encounter plays out in layers. With each layer, a new relic is added. The first layer is super simple as it only requires the use of the Pyramid Relic, which is just the Vex Cranium from Eater of Worlds and every other Vex-centric activity since the Menagerie. There will be taken knights shielded in Almond Milk that only this nut gamer will be able to kill. Killing these knights will reset the countdown clock to an imminent wipe, but that doesn't actually matter in this first room. To get out of this room, you'll need to shoot the correct symbols around the door. What the first room is actually trying to teach you in some roundabout way is how to figure out which symbols open the door. There will be a taken phalanx and a scorned captain that spawn, and killing them will cause some symbols to appear in the air. Only any given player can only see one of the two sets of symbols. This divide is split between players who have a relic job and those who are unemployed. Call out your sets of symbols and only one symbol will overlap between the two. That's the correct symbol. In every room after this you'll have two symbols to find instead of the one, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Shoot the symbol to open the door and then dunk your pyramid laser into one of the two buff altars. Once deposited you'll get a debuff that basically prevents you from picking up any relic for the duration of a room, but you can also proc this debuff by using your scroll wheel to accidentally drop a relic, which gets to be really unfortunate when your dumbass does so in one of the later rooms. Not speaking from experience or anything. Now we enter the second room and the Vex Phalanx shield from Vaults of Glass is added to the rotation. You'll start getting stacks of darkness again and the Phalanx holder's job is to keep cleansing people by use of the block button. 
What this really means is that your teammates will be playing keep away and won't let you anywhere near them until they're halfway across the map, shouting about having 9 stacks, and then dying because you should have been there. This room will also actually introduce the knights that the new pyramid laser holder will have to kill. Now kill your phalanxes and captains, and this is where it's very important that everyone is on the same page about what the callouts are called, because if one relic holder calls out Predator, Earth, Vor, while the other relic holder calls out Hive, Earth, Grief, and the only guy who recognizes the mistake doesn't realize he has his mic muted, everyone's gonna shoot Earth and get wiped indiscriminately. Do it correctly and you'll have both of the symbols you need to open the door and enter level 3. Switch your relics around and push forward. Level 3 introduces the Taken Blight Ball, which can blow up other Taken Blight Balls brainwashed into thinking that they're fallen servitors in the way that they make everything in a traveler-sized radius immune. Hit the grenade button while sitting next to it to break it. Now there's two patterns that level 3 can be depending on if the first Taken Blight Ball is on the right or on the left, which dictates which way certain relics and certain people should go. But the reality is that no two clear LFG player knows the pattern, so everyone just panics and runs around, forcing you to pray that the right people end up in the right place to read and relay the callouts. Push forward into the fourth room. At this point, everyone will have needed to touch at least one relic, and then press onward into the room with the most opportunity for jumping puzzle error. Kill, cleanse, reset, call, expunge, shoot, enter, dunk, and don't get blown up by screams in the process. Skate past half of the next jumping puzzle and pull your team to the final boss. Just look at this guy's entrance. All the grace of a spider and an Olympic swimmer as he just floats there menacingly after threatening you in incomprehensible ways throughout the whole raid. For this fight, you're gonna split into three teams of two, read Caretaker into positions of Splitter, Dunker, and Can't Do Mechanics Apologists. To start, run towards Roll can get bounced off of the shield to make him spawn a big bad dragon up in the sky. At least I think that's what they're called. Anyhow, one of the splitters will shoot the crystal and get the leeching force buff, a buff that does absolutely nothing except kill you after 40 some odd seconds, kind of like drinking antifreeze in a weird roundabout way. But the one thing you can do with that buff is stand on the huge Dorito Dust Gamer hand symbol and spawn two more big bad dragons for your teammates to shoot. The other splitter will shoot on the left side and one of the other dunkers will shoot on the right. Immediately following this, the splitter now holding the buff will hop onto the plate and split again, which should leave three people with the buff. Now, if you're like any team I've had the misfortune of playing with recently, then you'll do this split super early, which puts you in danger of your timer running out before you can actually complete the mechanic. Focus down the tank and phalanx and scorn captains to reveal the symbols where the buffed players can see one set and the non-buffed people can see the other. Find the commonality just like in the last encounter. While all of this is happening, Rook will teleport into one of the three-thirds of the arena and let loose some orange Kamehameha laser. Avoid this, unless you're a dunker, and then try to get hit by it. Anyone with a leeching buff who gets hit by an orange laser will have their buff swapped out for the emanating buff, which is a requirement for dunking. Any non-buffed player, which really means the splitter without the buff since the actors are off trying not to get killed by red bars, will need to call out the two positions where the common symbol is shown. Anyone with the buff is unable to see the symbols on the pylons, so you'll have to trust your teammate not to force the use of a res token, just like they're trusting your ability to tell your left from your right. From near to far, you have L1, L2, L3, and R1, R2, R3. The dunkers will prep themselves by the appropriate pylons, count down, and dunk. Technically, you don't have to dunk together, but in weeks where all the challenges are unlocked, which, let's be real, is the week you're suddenly motivated to learn the raid in, satisfies the challenge requirement. Start splitting and gathering the emanating buffs again, and after a total of six symbol dunks, Rook will finally drop his knockback kill aura and invite you up the steps into the dojo. Alright, so I've come to accept in the past 10 minutes or so that the Hyper 2-1-2-X Master Computer fan is a really long callout for how frequently it's going to be used in this encounter. So instead, I'm throwing out all the original callouts for these four symbols and doing something a little bit more intuitive. The symbols originally correlated to the exterior vessels of the Traveler and the Pyramids and the internal mechanics of the light and the dark. That said, those callouts are really common Destiny 2 buzzwords and I would hate for anyone to get confused. But then, it hit me. Bandages for outside wounds, alcohol for inside wounds. Extrapolate that across a field of light and dark and you get four extremes. Outside dark, band-aids. Outside light, gauze. Inside light, vodka. Inside dark, rum. This also creates a great way for you to memorize the symbols you can't see by noting that each of these axes are consistent in space. For example, a call of vodka would be a light side inside wound callout. Light callouts are in the south, and inside callouts are in the east, so vodka is the southeast callout. It may be a little bit extreme, but I'll do anything to actively shit on console players and their stupid R1 L2 PlayStation callouts. So for the dojo, the boss is gonna swing around his shiny glaive and use his thunder thighs to throat kick any guardian rocking tier 1 mobility while sitting in a well of radiance. 
To start the damage phase, someone will need to shoot his glaive to gain a mystery symbol. Somebody without a symbol will need to call out the symbol to them. The symbol holder will then have to get charged with Dayquil lasers, and then dunk according to the layout I just described. In total, you'll dunk four symbols. For each symbol deposited, Rook will take a page out of Riven's book and grow some massive pimples that will need to be shot. That joke is funny because none of you have done Riven legit, so you have no idea what I'm talking about. Once all four pimples are shot, damage will begin. But Rolk's Thunder Thighs have no breaks, so you'll have to continue running around while missing all of your linear shots or blowing yourself up with a rocket. If you hit hard enough, you'll enter Final Stand, otherwise he'll start charging up his knockback kill or a hacks, and you'll have to run back to the start to do another round of mechanics. In Final Stand, you'll start getting stacks of the Darkness debuffs to just nuke his luscious meaty tender thighs until he explodes into a tree, just like in my fever dreams. Well, congrats, I guess. That's Val the Disciple. After a very strict regimen, Rolk skipped leg day for a few thousand years, so his defeat was really his own doing. Go watch a real guide.